Hello, Global Gardeners. Welcome to another Monday. I'm in a gardening mood. It's kind of cold and drizzly outside. It's supposed to warm up. I'm going to get out and do some work. Got a lot of work done this last weekend. I hope you are able to spend time in your garden to get those plants all taken care of. This is such a great time of year, no matter where you live. Even those of us with a short growing season are starting to see signs of life in the garden. My garlic has sprouted. It's about an inch, maybe an inch and a half above the surface, which is fantastic. My crocus were blooming last week. The trees are just starting to bud. And this is just such a fun time of year for me as I look forward to the growing season. Got the plants started indoors, preparing to put them outdoors, even though that may be two months away. But it's just an exciting time to be thinking about gardening. Today, we're going to focus primarily on fertilizers, how to use them, what they mean, and all the confusion that are associated with fertilizers. But of course, we'll be answering all of your gardening questions along the way. And it's so nice to see everybody checking in. Yogi Lai is saying, I started some peas and a flower mix and egg cartons worked great that's always a a fun activity i like doing that with the kids in particular is to use the egg cartons as a way to start some of your your plants so good for you always nice to get out there and and be started i i put or i started some more of my seeds so i've been cold stratifying a number of seeds for months now and so, as I mentioned in, in the video on this months ago, I have some seeds that only required 30 days of cold stratification. Those have already been sown in, in my basement, and many of them are already growing very, very well. Then you have those seeds that require 60 days of cold stratification. Those are the ones that I just took care of. And I have some seeds that require 90 days of cold stratification. And so they're still in my refrigerator and I'll be I'll be putting those in the ground here in another couple of weeks. So it's just crazy. Regardless of what time of year it is, you can always find activities to do. So the idea that I have to wait three months with seeds in the refrigerator before I put them in is just crazy, but it makes all the difference in the world. Some of these seeds I've tried growing in the past without the cold stratification just had really low germination rates, but now they're doing great. In fact, I think, well, I know I sowed too many of those seeds, so you'll probably see a video about thinning out the seedlings as you overseed in your initial sowing. So that's fantastic. So uh, Sanctified by Truth says, this is great. Need to know what fertilizer is best for sweet potatoes. I know they need low nitrogen, high phosphorus, and a good amount of potassium. You got it right. And those are the some of the factors that we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> and so let's start with that because it's it's a common tendency, particularly with new gardeners, you hear all about nitrogen. Nitrogen is what plants need. I'm going to use a nitrogen fertilizer on my plants. That's true for many of the plants we're growing in our garden. It's not true for all of the plants we're growing in our garden. And so let's talk about the differences between nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and why in this instance with sweet potatoes, you actually want a low nitrogen fertilizer. And so when we talk about fertilizers, generally speaking, there are two different types of fertilizers we're going to use in our garden. There's inorganic fertilizers, and these are the, the, the chemical fertilizers that we usually get. They're synthetic in most cases and a viable option they're usually made to release whatever the nutrient happens to be in a form that can be used by the plants right away. And then you have organic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are, are made from some organic material like blood meal or bone meal or, or fish emulsion. And those often, most often, are not in that quick use uh, 
kind of form. So they need to be put into the soil in advance of when the plants are going to use them. And I'll talk more about that as we proceed. And so most of the fertilizers that, that we buy or borrow or steal to use in our garden are going to have three primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. And when you see on the, the box or the bag or the bottle, you'll see three numbers, and that's the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in that order, and the percentage of each of those within that particular box or bag or bottle. Because nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are, are what we call macronutrients that all plants need in one form or another. The nitrogen is responsible for the, the leafy growth of the plant. For all of the green you see in a plant, it's the nitrogen that's promoting the green. The phosphorus works more underground. It, it really targets the roots and is also an important part of flower development as well. And the potassium just kind of keeps everything in order. Potassium is what helps keep your plant healthy and keeps all of the mechanisms within the plant working properly so that it can use the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And then there are a couple dozen other micronutrients that plants can need. Copper, manganese, calcium, zinc, all of those are micronutrients that plants will need in a, typically a very small amount. And so as we start talking about fertilizers, we're mostly looking at the NPK on the fertilizers we're using. Right off the bat, you've heard me say this before, a soil test is very important in your garden. Good soil is key to your plant success. The assumption that we need fertilizer is really a bad assumption. You can do a soil test and find out that your soil is perfectly fine and you need no additional nutrients. Or you do a soil test and you find out specifically what your soil is deficient in. Now you can use a fertilizer, but the, the key difference with the success or not is too often we just blanket our garden with a balanced fertilizer. And when we call, or what we call a balanced fertilizer is one that's like 10, 10, 10. 10% 10 nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. Or a 12, 12, 12, or a 4, 4, 4. Those are balanced fertilizers. They have the same amount of each of those macronutrients, and we just put it into the garden. Well, you do a soil test and you may find out that your soil has ample amounts of nitrogen, for example. And if you add more nitrogen through a fertilizer, now you'll have too much nitrogen in your soil. And so the plants take up all those micronutrients. And if there's too many of the nutrients, they'll still take up too many more than they need. And that's often at the expense of some of those micronutrients that they really need. But it, it, it's like going to a candy store and just loading up on the sweets. If nitrogen is in your soil and you're a plant, you're just going to treat it like you would your favorite candy and just start slurping up all that nitrogen to promote all that new growth and all the, the green and the leaves at the expense of some of the other aspects of the plant. So now back to the sweet potato idea, the sweet potatoes we're growing those plants to harvest those potatoes that are growing underground, the sweet potatoes. And so if your sweet potato plant has too much nitrogen, it's going to put all the energy into the, the sugars, the carbohydrates, the green, the growth of the plants, and you're going to end up with very few and probably pretty small sweet potatoes. A whole bunch of growth on the upper part of the plant but what you're actually trying to harvest isn't going to happen. So instead, for something like sweet potatoes, you would want to focus on phosphorus as being a primary fertilization aspect. So you might have a fertilizer where the first number would be a two, 
2% nitrogen. The second number might be an 8, 8% 8 phosphorus, and then maybe a 6 for 6% 6 pot potassium. Those are the kind of fertilizers you'll see for root vegetables and those rooting crops where we want the root to really be the focus of our growth. When you're growing peppers or tomatoes, any of those kind of plants that require a flower that will then turn into the fruit that we're going to harvest, you have the same problem. If you've ever grown those kind of plants and you fertilize a lot, but yet you just don't get the tomatoes or the peppers or the squashes or the melons, it could be because you've got too much nitrogen. And so the plant is doing nothing more but just pumping out new leaves and it's not producing the flowers that need the phosphorus for their development and the potassium. With all the nitrogen, the plant's like, hey, I'm, I'm happy, I'm growing, who cares about those flowers? Who cares about that fruit? And so you're left at the end of the season with a bad harvest because you used fertilizer when it wasn't necessary or you used too much fertilizer, typically too much nitrogen fertilizer. So there's the opening statement on fertilizer. We'll get to more specifics and let's see what kind of questions we have. Yeah, Lisa Potter is exactly right. Wouldn't bone meal be a good choice for sweet potatoes? So as we talk about some of those organic fertilizers, Blood meal is a nitrogen fertilizer. It's, it's almost exclusively nitrogen and doesn't have the phosphorus and the potassium. Bone meal doesn't have the nitrogen, it has the phosphorus. And there are a couple other options. The one that I showed in, in the recent video where I was making the sill for my blueberries, green sand is, uh, one of those kind of minerals that's actually very high in potassium. You could also use ashes to give you potassium. There are a number of different ways to use some of these organic materials to give you the same nutrients. Or you can go with a, a chemical and an inorganic fertilizer to give you the same results. But yes, in this case, bone meal, because it's phosphorus, would be a type of fertilizer you might want to use on your sweet potatoes. But the key point, and remember this throughout the discussion today and throughout the next year and years ahead in your garden, it all depends on your soil and whether your soil is deficient in those nutrients. Fertilizers add additional nutrients. If those nutrients are already there, you don't need any fertilizer at all. If your soil is deficient in certain nutrients, those are really the ones that you should target rather than just doing a balanced fertilizer across everything, which really could lead to some troubles because, and, this, and it gets kind of crazy, it's counterintuitive, but by adding fertilizer to your soil, you can actually decrease the fertility of your soil because it's all those microbes that are in the soil that are turning these fertilizers into a usable form for the plants. When you add, especially the chemical fertilizers to your soil, you're disrupting the natural balance within the soil. So a lot of those microbes that are making the nutrients available for the plants will be killed in, in, a, in a fertilizer rich soil to the point that now the actual soil life and the nutrients in the soil will decrease, which necessitates you to add more fertilizer. And it becomes, that's what's happening with industrial agriculture is they use fertilizers, it, it just destroys the soil and they have to use fertilizers every year because there's no fertility in the soil. I don't use a lot of fertilizers because I want to build my soil life and let the, the soil microbes, the soil organisms take all the organic matter that I'm putting into the soil and turn it into usable nutrients for the plants. So those are a, a just, you know, some basic guidelines of how I approach my gardening. Okay, let's see what else we have. 
Lisa Potter saying, how do you know where to test raised bed soil? I have six different raised beds in different parts of the garden. Should I test them all? And so when you do a soil test, the general guidelines that you'll see if you do a university laboratory test, they'll, they'll tell you how to do it. And I did a video about this a couple of years ago when I did a soil test for this new garden space that I'm developing. And you take samples from different areas. And generally those samples are gonna be 10 to 12 feet apart, depending on how big a space you're going to be growing in. You mix all those samples together, you send it off, and then you get your soil tested. If all of your beds have the same or similar soil, then you can do a sample from each of six beds, mix it all together, send it in for a sample, and that will give you a good idea of what your, what your raised bed soil is like. If you have filled the, the beds at different times with different recipes, then you might want to do soil tests for each of those beds individually. Same kind of idea where you would take a sample from different spots within that bed, mix it together, and then send it out for a sample. Depending on where you're at, there are some extension offices that offer free testing. And so if you've got access to free testing, I say get each individual bed tested and that'll give you the best idea for what soil you have. Some of us don't have free testing and we have to pay for it. It's, it's all relative. I think I paid about $35 for my test. Well, for me at least, testing every single bed and paying $35 for each of those tests I'd rather just go ahead and get a sampling of six different beds, put it together, and that gives me a good idea of what it is. So one test for six beds, if you gotta pay for it, that's the way I approach it. Or individual tests if you don't have to pay for it. So hopefully you can choose the best option for you. But do try to get a sample from different areas. It's one of those things that, especially if you've been fertilizing, and now you dig up an area for a soil test, well, that one area that you dig up and send in may totally skew the results of the, the test for your bed, because maybe you dug up an area that just happened to have a big clump of nitrogen in it. Well, that's why you take different samples from different areas and then mix it all together to try to get a more representative sample. Okay, let's see. Jay is saying, I view myself as a soil farmer with vegetables as a byproduct. I focus on natural local amendments as much as possible for many reasons. Great philosophy, Jay. I really like that. And I completely agree. If, if you are growing your soil, if you are working to make a healthy soil, the plants are going to be great. They're going to grow great, look great, give you a great harvest because it's all about the soil. And that's a big reason why I don't use fertilizers much because I'm putting my attention into building the soil. And I know that using fertilizers can decrease fertility and I want to increase fertility. So it's, it's a touchy game to play if you don't know what your soil is to try to assume that by adding something, you're going to make it better by adding one of these fertilizers. And, and that's the problem most gardeners get into is because you see so many videos on YouTube that say it's springtime. I'm going to fertilize all of the plants as I put them in. I'm, and and midsummer, it's, oh, it's time, it's, it's flowering time. I'm going to fertilize all my plants. And, and that's, that's valid. If you have a terrible soil and your plants need those nutrients, then spring is a good time to fertilize. It's a good time to add the nutrients to the soil. And the plants are going to use more nutrients during their critical growth phases, like putting on flowers and fruiting. And so that's why, that's why you fertilize in spring and when the flowers are appearing and when the fruits appearing that's valid what's missing from those videos and what's missing from that discussion is soil in the first place if you have a healthy soil you won't need those fertilizers and so you'll be seeing more of my videos you can go back 
into the videos I've had in recent years of my garden when it's actively growing. And that's all from compost and the organic material and the mulches. The Almost all of my beds have not been fertilized. And I'm still growing all the big green lush plants and getting all the harvests. You don't need fertilizer if you are growing your soil, as Jay says. If you're a soil farmer focused on the soil, then a lot of that advice you really don't need to follow. And and it's it's out there because that's just the way we've been doing it for for decades is fertilize. That's what you're taught. That's what you do. It works, so you keep doing it. I like the idea of reaching a point where I don't have to pay for fertilizers. I don't have to worry about fertilizers. I just let the natural benefits of a good soil work for me and benefit my plants accordingly. Now, I will say, as I'm building these beds and adding more beds to my garden and filling them with with fresh organic material, I will, in some cases, and, and it varies by bed and what I'm planning to grow, but I will use a slow release organic fertilizer in the soil in spring to help increase the nutrients. Because I know that some of the beds I have, particularly the in-ground beds, are, are nutrient deficient because of the soil tests I've done. So I'll add that slow release granular organic fertilizer to the soil at the same time I'm adding compost and other organic material, mix it all up. And I'd like to do that at least a month before I plant because those microbes need to get to work and those microbes are going to break down that fertilizer into a form that can be used. And a big reason I do that is because especially the raw organic matter that I'm adding to the soil requires nitrogen to decompose. It requires nitrogen to break down. And so if I know my soil is deficient in nitrogen and now I'm adding organic matter that's also going to be using nitrogen to break down and, and become usable for the plants, I've created a nitrogen deficiency in that soil as I'm trying to improve it. So I'll add a fertilizer with nitrogen in it to help with those microbes, to help with that decomposition and to help avoid that nitrogen depletion. But for my raised beds where I'm just using organic matter on a regular basis, I don't worry much about the fertilizers because all the nutrients are there. Dr. Elaine Ingham, with the soil food web, she says that every soil on the planet has the nutrients that plants need to grow. The key here is that what we think of as poor soil, the reason it's poor is because it doesn't have the organic matter and it doesn't have those soil organisms growing to make all of those nutrients available. So Dr. Elaine says the soil's good everywhere. You just need to take the effort to build the soil to the point that the organisms and the plants are using all the food within the soil. So let's see what else we have as we roll along. Let's see, DLR978 says, local rabbits left many piles of nitrogen-rich fertilizer next to the kale I was overwintering. Uh, that's good. And so there, that gets that back to the idea of balance. You may have lost some of your kale plants to the rabbits, but between the rabbits and the birds and what other animals you might have, chickens, and especially if you can get manures of all different type of plant-eating animals, yes, those manures are often very nitrogen rich, which is a great thing to consider adding to your soil, either directly or through a compost pile. I usually compost it first, but I've got, I've got the deer droppings and the rabbit droppings all through my garden, and I just leave them in place as part of nature, and they'll break down and they'll improve the soil. So yeah, I agree with you. That is a, 
a nitrogen rich way to 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 deal with it urban chicken mama saying i dug up old plants and replaced them with beautiful new flowering plants what should i do with the huge root balls <coughs> and so you can compost roots roots take longer to decompose than the greeny uh, material like the leaves and the stems of plants but you can still uh, break down those those root balls any of the soil that's still on those root balls you should reuse the 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 richest part of the soil as far as the biome as as far as all those microorganisms are directly around the roots and so the soil that root ball soil has more of those beneficial organisms than any other part of of the bed so definitely reuse that soil into a pod into raised beds and then the roots themselves can be composted it's just going to take longer for them to break down so that i, I do that all the time you can also um, put them into uh, a, a big pile in the yard and mix them with leaves and treat them like you would in making leaf mold uh, you can also just bury them in the ground and they'll break down over time as well. So it's organic matter that should find its way back into your soil, either through compost or leaf mold or, or just bury them and let the soil organisms uh, eat at it and, and break it down over time as well. <coughs> okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I see Samantha Bai says, I chopped up the root balls and just mixed them in the soil in the fall. There you go. Yeah, the, the 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 interface is just so incredible. The interface between the roots and the soil and the soil organisms is just absolutely incredible. And so, within the roots in a healthy soil, you'll you'll have both bacteria and fungi that are actually interfacing with the roots. And so, when you reuse the roots into your soil, uh, but yeah, chopping up is a great way to accelerate the decomposition. You're taking a lot of those beneficial microorganisms that are already there that and those are the kinds that are doing the interface and so don't get rid of them use them and and add it to what you're already doing <coughs> ultimate gardening hello my videos haven't been performing the best I currently have 2.21 thousand subs and only get up to 60 views while other channels with fewer subscribers and more views tips on improving so just keep cranking them out and so uh, the, the, the thing about videos and finding an audience is you've just got to be yourself, give your message, do what you want to do, refine it so that you are more comfortable with it, and, and you'll find an audience. The, the, you know, I, I just recently completed my 350th video. It was 75 videos, and, if you, and it's a bit embarrassing if you go back to some of my earlier videos. They were rough. I don't necessarily enjoy watching them. The information is still valid and good, but the videos themselves are rough. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get doing it, and the more likely you're going to have with success. This month, April, is my 10th year here on YouTube. And so... I don't want to say that YouTube penalizes new channels, but it takes a while to develop traction, to get an audience, to figure out what you're doing and how to do it. And I, I basically spent five years before I started getting any views on my videos. And that may seem surprising to you, but that's just the way it works. You just got to keep making videos, keep pushing forward and and keep enjoying what you're doing and that'll come across in the videos as well so hope that helps a little bit uh let's see mage gray wolf hello to you too with this wiki journal found i'm thinking of going through all these gardening videos i can find and writing down the information from them <coughs> that's a good idea that's actually what i do um and and so i'll have an idea of something that i want to to learn something about or maybe make a video about or just reinforce what I already know and I'll just go through and, and essentially binge watch gardening videos on a particular subject and I, I take notes and a lot of the times the notes are 
don't do it this way. So when I do my video, I'll, I'll show it the way that it really should be done. And other times it's, oh, wow, this is a good idea. I'll do it this way. And I like to try most of what I do in my videos in my garden first. And so I'm, I'm regularly doing that, going through videos, making notes, trying new things. And then when it works, I'll make a video about it in the future. I'm doing that with sweet potatoes right now. So you won't see a video about it this year because I'm trying a couple different methods to do the slips for the sweet potatoes. And then what I find works best, you'll probably see it next year in a video because of all the notes that I took and that watching a whole bunch of videos idea. I, I think that can be really effective. Of course, watch my videos if I've got a video about it, but I don't have videos on every subject. So get out there and watch some of those other channels and see what else you've got going. Okay, Pretty Alice Moon, nice to see you here today. My channel isn't garden related exactly, but I've been on since 2013 and still don't even have a thousand subscribers, although I'd really like to going to be posting garden tour videos each month. <clears throat> That's good. That's a great way to start. I So so for my channel, I, I did some videos here and some videos there. And it wasn't until I spent a year doing one video every single week at the same time with that gardening theme that I started getting more subscribers and started seeing the results. And then the next year I started doing two videos a week, every single week. And that's when the numbers really started to climb. And so that's what it takes on YouTube to, to have a successful channel is to find something that, that, that you like doing, do it a lot of it. And then once you figure out what you like, then hopefully the audience will find you. And sometimes they do. And sometimes they don't, there's a lot. I, and I've said this before, I have a spreadsheet I'm tracking. I think I just added another six or seven this week, but, but there's close to three or 400 gardening channels on YouTube. Every time I come across a new gardening channel, I add it to my spreadsheet. I check them out. I watch some videos. And, and so I track the growth of, of channels just to see what's happening out there. And there are some really good videos in the gardening world that just don't have the subscribers yet. And, and it's, it's so hard to explain, but often it comes down to a single video. One video just takes off and that makes all the difference in the world. And sometimes you can have a channel with a lot of good videos, but they just don't have that one video take off. And for me, it was four years ago now, I guess, yeah, I think it was four years ago, I had one video on the best tomato trellis and I showed how I made a cattle panel or used a cattle panel to make a trellis for tomatoes. That was my first video that really took off and and really started increasing some of my numbers. And then two years later, I had the video on how to fill a raised bed showing Hugo culture basics in the bottom of the bed. And that one's really taken off. I can attribute most of my growth from those two videos. And so you just never know. You just got to keep making the videos, keep cranking them out, keep having a good time. And hopefully you'll have some success with that. So, okay. So let's switch, shift back to the idea of the, the fertilizer today, and how we're going to use fertilizer, if we need to use fertilizer, what kind of fertilizer we're going to use. And all of this is completely up to you. I, I prefer to use organic materials. I prefer to use the blood meal, the bone meal, those type of things. I make my own fertilizer. So I grow comfrey and comfrey is a great plant. It's one of those, those nutrient accumulator plants. And so the deep roots of the, the comfrey plant will go into the soil. And remember the soils have the nutrients. You just have to get those to your plants. Well, comfrey is a plant that goes into the soil and then takes about 15 or 16 of those nutrients into the plant and the leaves are now filled with all those nutrients that have been drawn out of the soil. Comfrey is a wonderful plant to grow to make your own fertilizer because the leaves of comfrey now are loaded with those nutrients. 
you harvest the leaves, you make an extract by soaking the leaves in water, and now you can add those nutrients back to the soil. And because you're adding it in a water-soluble form, essentially, in that extract, it makes it easier for those soil microbes to now take that comfrey water and turn it into the nutrients for other plants. And so at the Galileo School Garden, we used comfrey extract as one of our primary organic fertilizers. And we used it because our soil wasn't as rich as we would have liked it to be. And so in springtime, as the seedlings were emerging and starting to grow, we added our comfrey extract or fish emulsion. I used a lot of fish emulsion later in the year. And so as the tomato plants are growing and starting to flower, we would use fish emulsion on the tomato plants and a lot of the other plants in the garden. So organic can be a way to go, but especially with the comfrey and the fish emulsion, they can smell bad. So it's one of those things you do outside on a breezy day so it doesn't smell so bad. But those are the kind of things that you can do. Or the, the, the chemical water-soluble fertilizers can be used and be available right now. And all those big names that, that you're familiar with on the fertilizers will sell you those water-soluble fertilizers. Your choice as to whether you make your own or, or get an organic compost tea or worm tea to put on, on your plants or in your soil, make your own or go the synthetic route. The plants don't know the difference. And so if you put a synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in your soil or you put an organic nitrogen fertilizer in your soil, <coughs> the plants don't know the difference. To them, it's nitrogen. And technically, it's really not the nitrogen. It needs to be broken down into a couple different forms, one being ammonium. And so it's ammonium that comes from the nitrogen through the process of those microbes that the plants are using. Plants really don't care if it's synthetic or organic. They really don't. It's just a nutrient to them. It really comes down to you and your philosophy and how you want to use fertilizers that will really determine which ones you choose to use, if you need them at all. I still think building the soil is really the, the best way to do it. Urban Chicken Mama says, Hugh Richards recently had a video about making fertilizer out of mulch. You just put it in a bucket with water for a few months. I figured I'd give it a try since I just got a chip drop delivery. Well, congratulations on your chip drop delivery. That's awesome. And so, uh, yeah, the idea between or behind that, and you can do it with anything. So I like comfrey just because I know comfrey is packed with nutrients, the comfrey leaves. But you can do it with anything. If you have a whole bunch of, of weeds, you've just weeded your garden, you can take a bucket, fill it with those weeds, cover it with water, and you will have an extract that will cause all of those nutrients in those weed stems and weed leaves to now leach into the water. You can do it with compost of, of any type. You can do it with mulch of any type. Stinging nettle is another great plant in the same category as comfrey that's loaded with nutrients. And so stinging nettles can be grown. Same thing, chop them off, put them in water. And so it, if you think about how plants are growing, they're taking the nutrients from the soil to make the plant grow. Primarily those three macro ingredients, those, those fertilizers, and so or the, the nutrients that are in the fertilizers. And so the plants have all those nutrients in the leaves, in the roots, in the stems. If you take any plant, you can soak it in water and those nutrients will leach out and you can put that back into the soil. When we put all of our plants into compost, we're doing the same thing. We're allowing the, the bacteria to break down those plants, release those nutrients into the compost. You can just do it in a bucket and uh, add water. The plants have the nutrients. We just have to decide how we get those nutrients out of the plants 
and then recycle them back into our garden. So yeah, wood chips, weeds, leaves, grass, whatever you wanna use, get it back into your garden in one form or another, and it really can be a good way to, to improve the soil. Eileen says, want to say thank you, you're welcome. You suggested a few months ago to try to learn more about soil. I've been watching Dr. Elaine Ingham and stuff on the Soil Food Web. Appreciate your garden or guidance. So, well, I'm glad I can help. And <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Ingham has got um, just some some incredible information about the Soil Food Web, and and it's more than than the nutrients. It's a web of life and all of those organisms working together and creating an environment that will benefit the plants. And, and, and like Jay said earlier, you're building the soil and it'll benefit the plants. You're growing the soil. Oh, and yeah, the plants are a nice byproduct of all of that. Too often we think that when we use a fertilizer that we're fertilizing the plant. And, and that's really kind of a, a misunderstanding of the process. We're not fertilizing the plant. We're adding nutrients to the soil by using a fertilizer. And then the plants are using the nutrients that we've added or not added if we add organic materials instead. Okay, let's see. Um, Ivan is saying worms everywhere. Yeah, that's actually, I use worms as an indication that I'm getting close to that point. If you, if you have a really good, healthy worm population, because you've got all the organic matter that the worms are seeking out, you're probably getting pretty close to that point that you don't need to be adding fertilizers anymore. The worm castings actually have uh, a relatively high percent of nitrogen. Now, it's not a lot of nitrogen, but with all of the nutrients in the worm castings, nitrogen is a component of that which is why worm castings can be a great material to add to your potting mix or to your garden in general is because of the, the microbes and the nutrients, but that nitrogen component in worm castings. So keep adding the organic matter. And if you see the worms, <coughs> that may be a time to do a soil test and, and you can recognize that you aren't deficient in your beds. The, the plants will have everything they need to do or need to have. Mayday Garden says, if making a water bucket fertilizer, make sure to cover with a lid to avoid mosquito larvae and smell complaints from the grouchy neighbor. <laughs> it sounds like you may have had that happen to you. Uh, yeah, especially anything like comfrey, when I make the, the comfrey tea or comfrey extract, it's in that bucket for about a month covered. You get anaerobic bacteria that break it down. The anaerobic bacteria don't need oxygen, which is why you can cover it and it also makes it smell pretty bad and so any of this material that you're going to be making into an extract you can leave open but you're right it does raise the possibility of of mosquitoes laying eggs and the larva developing or you cover it and now you cut off the oxygen which means the anaerobic bacteria come into play and it really becomes pretty smelly and hopefully your neighbor's not going to complain too much but do be aware that is a possibility. Patricia is saying, yesterday we had unexpected visitors, including four children. Although I had decided not to have a garden this year, I ended up planting two trays with the children. Great experience. Outstanding. That's that's fantastic. I gave a talk this, this last week to an organization talking about getting kids involved with the garden. And 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 your point is exactly right. That That when kids get in the garden they get excited which makes us excited and it often helps improve our plan and outlook as far as what we're going to do in the garden when kids are there we want to do more so good for you i'm glad you got some kids in the garden and i'm glad that you were uh, able to get some plants in the ground that you weren't planning to do so thanks for sharing that intrepid crossing there's talk about fertilizer shortage and how they use natural gas to produce nitrogen fertilizer. Can we fertilize without all that and just go organic? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yes, many of the synthetic fertilizers are petrochemicals. They do come from some aspect of the oil refining industry. And yes, with the potential shortages 
it's possible. I haven't read anything or seen anything specific about that, but certainly it's possible that those synthetic fertilizers are either not going to be available or they're going to be more expensive. And absolutely, you can do the whole thing organically as everything we've been talking about so far with some of those or organic fertilizers that, that you can buy, the blood meal, the bone meal, the fish emulsion, the kelp. There's lots of things out there. Bat guano, which is really good if you can find it. There are a lot of those things that are completely organic that you can use in your garden. Or last year, I put in stinging nettle in my garden. And the year before that, I put in comfrey for the purpose of using the comfrey and the stinging nettle as organic ways to add nutrients back to my soil. So it may require a little bit of planning and it may take a little bit of time, but you can absolutely do the whole thing organically. And you can reach the point that you're not spending any money at all because you are producing all of that organic material that you need to make it happen. So uh, go organic. And, and, and when I say go organic at, to your question, I'm not saying that you have to go to the store and buy a product that is labeled certified organic. Growing organically means not using synthetic chemicals. To me, that's the way I approach it. If I don't use synthetic chemicals and I'm using organic materials and practices that promote the use of organic materials, then I'm growing organically. I'm not going to the store and buying organic labels because a lot of what's on those labels are things that I can make myself or, or you know, like I said a couple times now, just adding the organic material, the grass clippings, the leaves, the compost, adding all those things to the soil is adding organic materials that the soil organisms can now turn into usable forms for the plants. And so I don't need to go to the store to buy all that type of stuff that I'm adding to my soil because it's all around me. I'm just, I'm just reintroducing the plants I grow back into the garden. Not your problem. Thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate that. Can I use worms from my lawn in my raised bed? Absolutely. In fact, I, I encourage that. The, the worms that are in your lawn are already showing you that they're native to your area. So they can survive the winters, they can survive the summers, and they obviously have found something in your landscape that they like, your soil. And so, especially on a rainy day, if I see the, the worms start crawling out and crawling across the sidewalk or the driveway, I pick them up and take them back and put them into my garden beds. Absolutely. And that, you know, I've, I've said this before, build it and they will come. If you add all that organic matter to your soil, the worms will find it in time. But if you can introduce the worms, excess worms you find in other areas like your lawn, absolutely put those into your raised beds and, and you'll, you, you'll basically speed up the process of the worms finding your, your vegetable garden and the, the soil that you're trying to, to improve. So wonderful. I used to do that at the school. Uh, when we'd have a rain, I'd have the kids literally walk around the basketball court with little cups, picking up the worms, and then we'd take them into the garden and just pour them all throughout the garden in different areas to include the, the garden bed. So yeah, wonderful way to do it. D Birdwell, thank you for that super sticker. I really appreciate it. Thank you for, for the contribution and the support. That's marvelous. And Ultimate Gardening, thank you. Thanks for the support and shout outs. Hopefully we can collab one day. So I, I am hoping, and I, I've actually talked to a few and maybe we can do that someday. Uh, the, the, the collab idea, and I like supporting the, the new channels and the young channels and the small channels. And so I do hope to do more of that. So thanks for that contribution and thanks for that suggestion. And, and we'll see what we can do. D. Birdwell, thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate it. Wow, a flood of contributions. Thank you so much, everybody. 
I, I really appreciate that. I'm trying to scroll down and catch up to where we were. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's a nice way to, to start the Monday. And thank you, not your problem. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I, I, I love doing this. You know, this is one of those things that um, I, I, I see it as knowledge, but I also see it as experience, and I see it as a way to help all of you. And so I, I say this almost every week, but I really like doing this because I really like seeing the difference it makes, especially like when we talk about kids in the garden. You know, I'm not going to be here forever. We all are going to move on and just end up being a memory, hopefully a memory for the people we know. But if we can share the message, share our experience and share our knowledge with others, then it, it just grows and it spreads and it becomes a, a legacy. I'm not seeking to create a legacy, but it's one of those things I think, you know, 50 years from now when somebody has a garden and they're telling somebody else how to do it and they say yeah when i was a kid i was taught by this this old neighbor of mine and that old neighbor well they were taught by somebody else and when you do the math you know what we're talking about here today two or three generations may go by of this information being spread to the point that 50 years from now, people are still using the same basic information about collecting earthworms and putting them into your bed or feeding the soil and growing the soil to feed the plant and not just dumping a bunch of chemicals on it instead. So that's why I do this. And so I'm so glad to, to share that. Lisa Potter, thank you very much for that. I appreciate you and this group so much. And yes, absolutely. This is a fantastic group you all are just so amazing it really does get my gardening week started and so it, it, it's a fantastic approach to to get us out get us thinking about gardening and that's why this time of year is just so special to me because like i said at the beginning all of us even those of, of you in south africa in australia where you're you're starting to see the end of your season you're still growing stuff and you're still planning on getting out in the garden. And those of us who still have snow in the forecast, and I just measured the temperature of the soil in my, my green stock tower yesterday, and the soil in my green stock tower is 30 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about minus one Celsius. And so it's still too cold for me to be growing and I want to be growing, but at least I'm thinking about growing and and to see the, the 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 life start to reappear in my garden is fantastic. So just the excitement of doing all this is also one of those things that we need to to move forward with. And I agree completely with Paul. You don't realize how much you know until you start sharing your knowledge. And and this I actually mentioned this at the talk I gave on Saturday, and I made a video about it a few years ago. I think the best way to learn about gardening is to teach someone else about gardening because you don't realize how much you know until you have to formulate the ideas of how to explain something to somebody else. And then all of a sudden it reinforces what you know, brings it to the forefront of your mind and you go, oh yeah, I guess I really do know more than I thought. And then you can build on that. And that's where the kids in the garden really become important because kids are just little sponges and they have no idea about how to do anything when it comes to gardening. And so you can just fill their little heads with all that knowledge that you have. Even if you don't think you have the knowledge, you do. And so get the kids in the garden, get others in your garden and share your knowledge and, and you'll be better. You'll definitely know more than you thought you did. Okay, let's see. Looks like Frank started to say something. <coughs> so I'll, I'll leave that. Susan says, good morning. Have to work this morning. So we'll be listening on replay. Just want to say hi. Give a green thumbs up. Well, hi to you, Susan. And I hope you are joining us on replay. See that we are talking about you right now. Thanks so much for that. Mary says, I had a seed sowing party Saturday and the ladies had so many questions. Watch Gardener Scott was my answer. Thanks. <coughs> Actually, you know, 
I, 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 I recognize that, that I've been doing this for a long time and I do know a lot about gardening. I don't know anywhere close to everything. Nobody does. I know, I know a lot about what I don't know, which is why I'll binge watch videos and why I've got so many books in my gardening library. But uh, I was, I gave a talk two weeks ago, almost three weeks ago now, to a local gardening club, and a daughter of one of the members of that club was there in the talk, and she had heard that I was going to talk and and insisted to her mother that she had to attend and so she was there i got a chance to talk to her afterwards and she actually worked at a local nursery and at the nursery when they were asked a question that they couldn't answer their response was to go to gardner scott and watch the videos so to me that's one of the the best compliments i've ever received and that's why i do what i do why i make the videos because i recognize gardeners of all levels myself included have questions and need answers and back to the idea of if you're trying to start or have a gardening channel if that's your approach to be an information source there's just a ton of information that you can become knowledgeable in and then convey it back to people. Fertilizer for me has always been one of those areas that I just didn't quite know enough about. That I just didn't really understand why we're told to use fertilizer by everybody. And then the more I learn about it, I recognize, no, you really shouldn't be using fertilizer all the time for everything. And so that's that's what this gardening journey is all about for each of us to figure out what works best for us in our own unique gardens and then make the appropriate changes or modifications, be it organic gardening or not. Small gardening, big gardening, vegetable gardening, flower gardening, it, it, it all makes a difference. And so as we look at our individual unique gardens, especially as they apply for fertilizer. <coughs> if you plant flower bulbs in autumn for the spring flowering plants, so you're, you're putting in your crocus, your tulips, your daffodils, those are going to be, the bulbs are going to be planted in autumn, and then they'll come up in spring. And so when you see all of the advice, and, and I have a video on this, and I give the same advice because it is valid, for most of us, you're going to use a phosphorus fertilizer when you put those bulbs in the ground. Phosphorus, uh, and it's often sold as like triple phosphate. And so of those three numbers, that second number is going to be very high because phosphorus benefits the roots. We're planting a bulb or a corm or a rhizome, which is a root. And so we're adding that kind of fertilizer at planting because phosphorus nitrogen goes throughout the soil and you could leach out nitrogen very easily just by overwatering whereas phosphorus tends to stay put and it doesn't travel throughout the soil and so when you are planting those those bulbs you put in a phosphorus fertilizer at planting that's the way everybody does it that's the way we all know to do it but when you delve deeper into soil science and how those microbes work, you find out that the soil pH actually now becomes a pretty important factor. And so in some regions, like here in Colorado, we have a pretty high pH. And, and you go to some of the information that Colorado State University has about adding fertilizers, and they say there's no reason to add bone meal, for instance, remember a phosphorus fertilizer, if you have a pH above 7.0, because the soil organisms that will make that phosphorus available for the plants, that's too high a pH for them. So you're wasting all of your bone meal, all of your triple phosphate fertilizer, if you have a high alkalinity in your soil. Well, that just goes against everything we know. But that's just the science. The pH matters. 
And so if you're trying to grow and you, you know you have a phosphorus deficiency, you also have to look at things like soil pH because you can add all the phosphorus you you have available to a, a phosphorus deficient soil. But if the pH is too high, it's not going to make any difference at all. One of the ways to lower pH is to add organic matter to the soil. Adding organic matter like compost will tend to moderate the soil pH, bring it closer to neutral. Well, by adding all that organic matter, you're also adding the nutrients back to the soil. So when you focus on the soil and include aspects beyond just the organic matter, start thinking about the soil pH, that also impacts what kind of fertilizers you're going to use. So acidic soil and alkaline soil are going to process, the, the microbes in the soil are going to process fertilizers differently, which is another reason why it becomes so confusing. Because you'll have one gardener that will use a fertilizer and have great results, and you have another gardener that uses the same fertilizer and has terrible results. It's about the soil, and it's about everything that's happening in your soil to make the fertilizer available to your plants. I know I'm blowing your mind right now, but this is this is how in-depth you can get about fertilizers, which is why I don't use a lot of fertilizers, because it is too confusing, and it is too involved to find out all the specific scientific aspects of what you really need when a healthy soil just kind of makes it easy. I'm a relatively lazy gardener, and if I can just make my soil healthy and not worry about fertilizers, that's what I'm going to do. Sure, a lot of work involved to get the soil healthy, but then it can just sit back and let the plants be happy, and that makes me happy. Thanks, Karen. I appreciate that. Thanks for all I do, and you're very welcome. Canada appreciates you. Well, thank you, and I would I like to think that Canada appreciates me. I, I, I know that, that we have lots of Canadians that are regular watchers, so I appreciate Canada too. I actually um, saw earlier, um, was it Dave? I forgot who it was, from Moncton in, in Canada. And when I was up in northern Maine in the Air Force, Moncton was one of the navigation aids that we used on a regular basis. So Moncton, I actually have visited Moncton. Uh, when I lived up there, we did some road trips through Canada. So I love Canada. It's all, always one of my favorite vacations whenever I can get up there, which just doesn't have as much time, it seems, to do much of that anymore. Lisa's asking, do you think it's worth the time and effort to do the Master Gardener course? So yes, and, and, and it kind of gets back to some of the statements I made earlier. So in the United States and Canada, they have in the different states and provinces master gardener programs that are run through a, a university. And the university sets up the training and it typically lasts a few months. And, and it, it, it's similar throughout all of the, the regions, but the information is very specific. And so I was a Colorado master gardener. And at the Galileo School Garden, I had a lot of volunteers. One of my volunteers had been a California master gardener, came to Colorado and realized she didn't know anything because the conditions were so different. One of my other volunteers was a Kansas master gardener. And she came to Colorado, same thing, so different. She came to be a volunteer with me so she could learn from me and figure out how to do things the Colorado way. That's a big reason why to go through Master Gardener training because it's specialized on your region and will give you specific information on your soil, your climate, your growing conditions. And so right there, I think it's it's worth it for, for nothing else than just to learn more about your area and how it impacts your plants. If you want to become an expert gardener, I really don't think a Master Gardener program is the way to do it. In a Master Gardener program, you're getting a broad education. And so you'll get three or four hours on each subject. So, so the soil, for instance, we actually, I think we had a whole day on soil, but it was divided into different sections. So you might, you might have three hours on soil organisms, and you might have three hours on fertilizer, 
of education and three hours on how to grow a vegetable garden and three hours on how to grow fruit trees and three hours on botany and three hours on this and three hours on that. And over the course of a few months, meeting once a week typically, you're exposed to a lot of different material. You're not being taught to be an expert. You're just being exposed to all of these different aspects of gardening. All of it is research-based, university research. And so that's another important aspect is you learn to recognize and appreciate the, the truth, the research, the science behind a lot of what we do in the garden. Those are the reasons I think it's important if you have access to it to consider taking a master gardener program, whether you're certified or not, different states have different certificates, really doesn't matter. There's a lot of good, broad information. After that, what you choose to do with it is totally up to you. I know a number of master gardeners that just did it for their own benefit, went home and hopefully grew better plants. I know others that use that information to then focus on a particular area that they really liked and wanted to learn more about. A good friend of mine is an expert on perennials, not much else. After the Master Gardener program, she recognized that's what she really wanted to learn more about, and she knows a ton about perennial flowers. So that's, that's how I would suggest you approach it. Get that broad education, decide if you're just gonna use it for yourself or if you wanna focus and learn more about it, or like I did, I, I figured out that I liked gardening and liked teaching about gardening and ended up teaching a lot of classes for the Master Gardener program as a result of it. You may discover that that's something that you have an interest in and like doing. The, the best way to become a, a master at gardening is just to do it, to just keep doing it. So all of you, I think, either already are or are close to becoming a master gardener in some aspect think about what you're doing right now in your garden and i bet you there's something vegetable flower fruit tree whatever it happens to be that you know a lot about so much to the point that you know more about that subject than the average gardener that's out there well I think that makes you a master gardener in that particular subject. And you didn't have to go to school. You didn't have to sit through a course. You didn't have to get a certificate. You've just become a master at gardening in that particular area. And the more we do it, there will be more areas that you become a master in. And so that's what I really encourage. I think if you can get a certificate, if you can go through the course, it's great, but I think all of us should try to master some aspect of gardening by just doing it and trying it and moving forward with every opportunity with that focus that there's that one thing that we really want to become good at and it 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 just a lot i, I look at it as if i can do that one thing that i'm really good at that just opens the door for me to find something else and now follow that that same journey and become really good at that other thing too and that's what i like to do that's that's why i know so much of what i know is because i've just tried to master one thing and then move on to another thing and master that and move on and master that and just have fun with it the whole way okay before i forget i want to talk about the background today this comes from josh at blue tick gardening <coughs> and um, this I, I really like this space it shows how much you can put into a small space and, and lots of different ways you can see right here these are some cinder block cement block uh, edging on this bed this bed over here has metal and wood back here this looks like reclaimed wood that's probably a little compost pile back there is a more formal uh, constructed bed and, and so this, this looks a lot like my garden because I try lots of different types of beds in different areas. You don't have to have the symmetry where everything looks alike. You can just add a bed when you're ready to add a bed, use whatever material you have at the time. And if you find a favorite, 
then use that as you expand the garden. So uh, I really like seeing all the different materials. In fact, even these, these posts <clears throat> along with the cinder blocks here, there's a, a cattle panel arch over here. And obviously there's some fencing, tall fencing around the outside here, I'm guessing for animals. And so uh, I, I appreciate you sending me this photo, especially since there's lots of green growing and, and sprouting in the beds. I, I don't have that yet in my garden. Uh, but as, as you know, if you watch this regularly on Mondays, all of our gardens are different. And so that's one reason why I ask you to send me your background, just so I can see how other people are gardening. And so we can share and, and see the things that, that we're doing. Back here, we you have this bucket, and that's a pretty big bucket. So, I, you know, I'm not sure if that bucket is being used to grow in or not. Um, you can also see this trellis right here that has the, the netting on it. And so lots of different things happening in this garden space. And, and it just goes to show you don't have to do things one way. You can do lots of different things. You can grow in a container. You can have trellises like back here might be growing up a fence, or you can have trellis with netting that things are growing up. And so hopefully as you all see these backgrounds every week, it might give you an idea of something to try in your garden. They often give me ideas to try in my garden, but I uh, just wanna thank you, Josh, for, for sharing your space and allowing us to take a look at it. You can see down here, I have a lot of these T posts to support some of the, you can see this, this light fencing along here that's uh, probably double purpose as a fence to keep some of the animals out, but also to trellis some of the materials that might be growing on the other side of it. So uh, send me your background. <clears throat> send me a picture of your garden to Gardener Scott at GardenerScott.com. Give me permission to use it if you would, just so I don't share something that you don't want me to share. Tell me a story if you want to tell me a story about what you're doing in your garden. Uh, but send me your pictures and, and I'll do what I can to add them to the queue and get them up there. And next week, hopefully, we'll have somebody else's garden to talk about. So um, thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. And Mrs. Marvel says, I appreciate you sharing this garden. This is more like what mine looks like. I've seen so many matching and manicured gardens, which makes me feel less inclined to share, even if I'm successful. Well, share it. Share your garden with me. And 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 exactly, you know, I everybody's garden is unique and different, and you got to do what's best for you. And don't feel like you have to look like somebody else's garden. I, I, I have an orderly garden with my bed spaced with all kinds of different materials, but my garden has not always looked that way. One reason it looks that way now is because I know I'm going to be filming and I set it up with some specific filming options in mind. But there are many sections of my yard that aren't pretty. And occasionally you'll see him in the background. I have people comment occasionally saying, you know, why should I listen to you? Your garden's a mess. Well, I don't think that's the right attitude. And like Mrs. Marvel says, I think if your garden is a mess, it should be encouraging, especially if you do have that success, because it shows you're doing it your way. And you don't necessarily have to follow the photos from some garden book to be successful. Just do it your way. Do it the way it works and have fun with it. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, that's actually a good idea <clears throat> from Mage Grey Wolf. Get on the roof to do an overhead shot of the garden. And I actually got a drone to do that with my garden. And I just keep forgetting that I have a drone to bring the drone out to do pictures. So um, I, maybe you'll see some overhead shots of my garden space this year if I can remember to get my drone out. But absolutely, get on your roof safely, of course. But seeing your garden from a different perspective, that overhead view can really be enlightening. There, there are so many times that I've done that, either up on a tall ladder or climbing a tree, and not always on purpose. I might have been in the tree for another reason, and then you look down, and you see your garden and it's like, oh, wow, I see this thing 
that I wasn't aware of before. And, and whatever that thing happens to be, that just helps increase your knowledge. And, and I have done it, and that's the reason I got the drone in the first place, is I was laying out my garden plan and trying to figure out where I was gonna put the different gardens within my garden space. And so I got the drone out to kind of give myself a bird's eye view as I was planning the garden. And it's just crazy that I haven't got it since to see what's actually happening in the garden. But uh, it's, it got me thinking that that's definitely something I need to, to start thinking about. So there's Jay. My garden structures are 95% salvage. I try to make them look nice and neat. People are shocked when I say it's salvage wood, metal, garden products. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you don't, you know, it gets back to, to, to that, that I said earlier. I, I don't like to spend money in the garden. I try to figure out how I can to save money and get to the point where I'm not spending anything. And salvage is definitely a, a great option. If you can salvage wood or metal or or anything, I'm, I, I'm hoping to get a video out here soon on uh, uh, some of the salvage material that I use making a cold frame, for instance. I'm making a cold frame from all salvaged material. And, you know, why not do that with other areas of your garden too? All of your beds and everything. So thanks for that, Jay, because you're exactly right. You can have well over 90% of your garden and it won't cost you a dime because you collect the materials and salvage them yourself. Or like in the case of my cold frame, I did buy the glass, but I got it at, at the, the Renew Recycle Center and just paid a fraction of what I would have paid for if I wanted something nice and pretty that was brand new. So yeah, save money at every opportunity. I definitely think that's a way to do it. Uh, Yogi Lai, I love my repurposed trellises. Clothes drying racks are great. Oh, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Clothes drying racks. Uh, I I had a um, an old bunk bed, a metal bunk bed, and I used the frame of the bunk bed, the, the slats that held the mattress, and I used that as a trellis. I still still do it. You can see it in some of my videos. I'll be using it again this year, in in my salsa garden bed. And so, absolutely, there's there's those kind of things that you can reuse of of materials that you never even thought about using in the garden. Clothes drying rack, bunk bed frames. If it suits the purpose that you want it to suit, do it. Don't worry about how it looks, because like Jay says, when you when you do it and plants are growing and it looks nice. People won't even be able to tell that it's repurposed. And even if they care, I don't care. But you can make your garden beautiful. And I think this is the beautiful garden. I love seeing how everything is organized. You can see all of the spaces, how everything is laid out. Oh, I wanted to talk about these, these blocks right here too. So this is a really great idea in between beds and pathways to use those concrete bricks. In fact, that's what I, that was my big project this week is I used these same types of squares inside my greenhouse. So I have my pathway and my sitting area done by using these. Very easy way to create pathways, and especially in really wet areas of your garden. So I like seeing a garden like this because it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I do that, I do that, I do that, I do that, I do that. And it helps reinforce what you're doing when you can see that others are doing exactly what you're doing and maybe you had second guessed yourself okay <clears throat> let's see a couple more and we'll get to some good philosophy stuff today um shandy's garden says <coughs> that's where i've gotten all my containers for anything that's in my backyard as well swimming pools buckets drawers yeah yeah start start expanding your your vision and being a little more creative in what you do in your garden and it may surprise you that you can really find some cool stuff some arty artsy kind of stuff that you can add to your garden and and if you can do that i think that's really a nice way to do it um bev is saying metal gazebo frames from old gazebos and chicken wire around my large garden beds to keep out the herds of deer there you go uh, and yeah if you if you can find an old gazebo and reuse that that I'd love to be able to do that. 
And so, <clears throat> okay, I'm convinced. Serenicity, and I've seen a few others of you that said a drone view in your videos would be awesome to see. So, okay. Well, I'll definitely plan that. <clears throat> and so, usually the, the video I do the first week of June, since I've moved to this new, new garden, uh, I have a, a garden tour to show you what I've accomplished in the in the previous year. And so this will be my third season here. So it'll be my third video. And so I'll definitely bring out the the drone for, for that video. Maybe maybe I'll try to throw it into a video before I get to that point. But you'll definitely see it at least in my garden tour video this year. So look for that. Colorado Bird Nerd, happy Monday to you. Learn so much. I was getting ready to add a bunch of fertilizer, but we'll see first about getting a soil test and then apply what I learned today. Thanks. I'm glad to hear that. The, the, the thing, well, there's, there's a few things, but one of the, the big issues with just fertilizing to fertilize is over fertilizing. And, and really, it's like over watering. Over watering can kill your plants. Over fertilizing can actually kill your plants or at least stunt them or cause a reaction that you're not getting whatever it is you want to get from that plant. And so I'm glad to hear that because uh, just just overdoing it becomes so easy. When when you get in that mindset of got to fertilize in spring, got to fertilize in midsummer, got to fertilize in fall, and then you do that every year and it doesn't take long for your soil to be over fertilized to the point that your plants start to suffer and then the plants start to suffer and if you're in that mindset of fertilizing what do you do well my plants obviously need more fertilizer and you're just exacerbating the problem so don't don't worry about too much of that try to make it as simple as possible and that actually brings me to th this point i wanted to end with today if, is that it it is so challenging it is so hard there is so much to know it's so easy to do things wrong. And I say wrong only in that you're not getting the results you want. I think there really isn't anything wrong in gardening because even if it doesn't work, hopefully you'll learn from it and you'll figure out why it should be different. But, but in the last couple of days, I've gotten some comments from different viewers who have said it, it's too hard. There's, there's too much to know. I tried this thing and and it didn't work. And I, I'm, I just want to give up. And that by itself, I understand. Totally understand. But what's being added on to it these days is a lot of gardeners thinking that they have to start growing food for their families. That they, they have to shift their gardening or, or maybe start gardening with that thought in mind. I have to do it right. I have to grow food for my family. I have to have a big garden and I don't know what I'm doing. And it's just causing so much stress and pain over this, this concept that I have to do it right because my family is depending on me. And I get it. I understand that mindset. But for all of you, even if that's not your main purpose for gardening, you will probably encounter those moments of, over the course of the year where you just feel you have to do something and it's not happening the way you want it to happen. Well, I suggest slow down. If you feel like you have to grow a lot of food and you don't know what you're doing and it's not working and you give up, the result of that is now zero. You went from this thing you wanted to do to not doing it at all. And not only is the result of your garden zero, but your stress levels, your, your discomfort has just skyrocketed. Instead, slow down, back up a little bit. You don't have to do 10 beds. I've talked about how you, in some of my videos, you need at least two preferably three raised beds per family member to provide the food that that family member is going to need from your garden. Well, if you've got five people in your family, don't feel like your very first year you have to have 15 raised beds or you're a failure. No, start with one or two. 
figure out how to do it, have some successes, and then next year expand. Sure, this year you're going to have to buy some food at the grocery store. You're going to have to go to the farmer's market. You're going to have to find alternatives. But if you try to grow 15 raised beds filled with food the very first year you've ever gardened, you're more likely to give up. And now where are you? So tough times for many of us as we move forward and our mental states are being challenged. So build on those small successes. Have that one bed of potatoes or that one bed with peas and Swiss chard and spinach or that one bed with tomatoes and cucumbers. And like I said earlier about mastering gardening, learn how to do that one bed of plants the best you can do. And you're not going to feed your whole family with a bed of tomatoes and cucumbers. But next year, your tomato and cucumber bed will probably be the best bed in your garden. And next year, you'll be focusing on growing the winter squash and growing the sweet potatoes or whatever it happens to be. Gardening is a journey. It takes time. It takes a lot of trial and error and experimenting. And there are a lot of failures along the way. But in time, you will be able to feed your family. You will have those successes and you'll still be doing it rather than just jumping in the deep end and drowning your first time out. It's okay to just start small, start slow, start with a plan in mind that you can follow and then have that success at the end of the season and build on that. That's much healthier for your mind and your body and it's much more likely that you will continue gardening and being successful in gardening by taking that approach. And that holds true for everybody. Even those of us that have been doing this for many years, you have to do that. At the Galileo Garden, 101 beds that we were growing in for food production, for the kids, for the school district. And I recognized I couldn't do it. Even with the volunteers and even with the students, there were a couple years because we were building, because we were expanding, because we were doing other things. There were the most of the years we were there, we, even with all that help, weren't doing more than 60 or 70% of our capacity. Because if we tried to do everything, then everything would have failed. So instead, we did what we could, the best that we could, and we had success with that. And that's what I, I want to leave you with today is that mindset. of Just do what you can with what you have and don't feel like you have to do more. Even if you think others are depending on you to do more, often that's not the case. It's your you, you yourself and I, that are, I being you, I, that are putting that pressure on you. And so gardening should be enjoyable. It's hard to enjoy it when you're always stressed and you're always afraid it's not going to work. It's not going to work all the time, but just try to enjoy it as much as possible. And if you can do that, then you can build to the point that you're self-sufficient and feeding your family and giving food away or selling food or whatever it is you're hoping to do. But it takes time, baby steps, a little bit here, a little bit next year, a little bit after that, and you'll get to that point that you can feel good about yourself and feel good about the gardening journey because that's what I want all of you to do is feel good about this gardening journey so that you will continue it. So if you're thinking about quitting this year, don't quit, just slow down, back off a little bit, maybe pare down what some of your plans were, but keep doing it because it will benefit you and it'll benefit the whole planet in the long run because you may end up being one of those people who teaches somebody who teaches somebody who teaches somebody and 50 years from now there is a family that is feeding themselves because you 
didn't give up and you shared the lessons that you learned with another generation. So that's what makes gardening so amazing is that we can share it and it can make us feel better. And so if it's not making you feel good, you're not doing it right. Just shift your focus a little bit. Hope that helps with you. And I completely agree with Lisa. Touch your soil. It's good for your mind. When you are feeling that stress, yes, absolutely. Get out in the garden. Get your hands in the soil. Let the nature give you the energy all around you that is there. And you just soak it up and you'll be able to make it through the day. So hope that helps. I'll see you here next Monday. I hope you have a great gardening week and get all those things done you want to get done. But if you don't get them all done, it's okay. You'd get them done later. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.